Good evening. My name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here for EdChat Interactive, and tonight we have Michelle Haken from uh, Rye, who's going to be uh, talking to us about diverse tools for diverse readers. Uh, Michelle is a featured speaker at FETC, and I'd like to encourage people who are watching this to uh, to check out FETC because um, there's going to be an awful lot of uh, interesting technology and an awful lot of interesting sessions at FETC this year. Um, I think it's actually in Miami. In the past, it's been in Orlando. So um, I guess really without further ado, let me hand over to Michelle and I'll be here in the background. Thank you so much, Mitch. Uh, thank you so much for everyone for being here. Uh, this, is, this is great to uh, get to connect with uh, all of you tonight. So I just wanted to switch over to my slides. So I, I wanna talk about some digital strategies and tools to support all of the learners in our classroom when we're talking about reading. And I wanna make this interactive and answer your questions throughout. So there'll be places where I stop and, and there's uh, opportunities for you to ask questions and interact. My guiding questions that I have for uh, when I was putting this webinar together was really thinking about the different types of readers in our classrooms and what are the most important considerations when we're planning our instruction, no matter what content area you're teaching. I'm a middle school English teacher and have been teaching a middle school English for the past 20 years. Um, and no, no matter the year or the day, uh, there are, my classroom is very heterogeneous and I'm constantly uh, trying to help support my diverse readers in the classroom. So that last question, how do you help the diverse readers in your classroom, especially when we have so many different types of readers in the classroom? What are some different uh, avenues that we can find for different texts as well as different strategies. So here is just a picture of my students in action uh, reading. We read all different types of text. You'll see that they're reading off of a computer screen, off of a mobile phone. We're reading actual paper books. Yes, we still have those in my classroom. Um, and then my students also have an, what I call an interactive notebook to sort of keep their thinking about their reading and their writing together in, in one place. So who are the readers in your classroom? When you, know, you think about you know, your student, your student populations, who are they? What do you, how would you define, identify, label those readers in your classroom? Any thoughts? Yeah, so as you were, as I was looking at the question, you know, my, my thoughts around, well, one way of classifying them would be around what their interests are. So some might be interested in arts, other ones might be interested in history, others might be interested in sports or different types of sports. Uh, but and another way of uh, of thinking about readers might be that some uh, some enjoy or prefer reading advanced texts, and others might prefer reading texts with more pictures or comic books. Yeah. Uh, um, and then I'm wondering also if um, if we might, you know, it, to my way of thinking, it's not just reading; it's really being it's uh, understanding meat content no matter what the media is. Yeah. So reading is a form of transferring content, but there are others. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And everything that you're saying, Mitch, is, is so important because yes, all of our students are coming in as individuals. They all have different interests. They all have different hobbies, experiences, knowledge. Um, and, and no matter what content we're teaching, you know, we all want our students that, to understand and le learn new information, and we're giving it to them through all different types of text, and that can be visual, digital, or that print text. So in my own English class, you know, I have, when I think about different readers, I have struggling readers, I have reluctant readers, I have, like you said, those advanced readers, 
uh, I call them schmoopers. They're the ones who um, basically read the back of the cover when you assign a book or you're reading in uh, book choices, but then they go online and they look at like um, Goodreads or schmoop to like find out all the chapter summaries. Um, <laughs> I have my like, yes, our standard, what we call English language learners, are students who will just skim through the pages. Uh, I don't know if you have students, but like my students will be looking at something online and they, for a research project, and they'll have a whole page filled with all different sites and links. And they'll say, there's nothing here. I can't find anything to help me. <laughs> they sort of skim through. Um, my sleepy readers, those are my students that save reading until right before they go to bed. And as soon as they read a page, they completely pass out and they have no recollection of what they are <laughs> reading. My book abandoners, who will, they'll open up a page and say, no, not interested. And then once in a while, you get a bookophile who is somebody who like where a student might be like sneaking their mobile devices on their lap and reading on their lap. I had a student last year who every day would bring in a new book and she'd be sneaking reading under her, on her lap when we were like doing in a mini lesson in small group work. I mean, and she just, I mean, she was amazing. World knowledge, vocabulary, uh, amazing, like wore Harry Potter t-shirts every day. But the, the idea is that there's so many different uh, readers in our classroom, and how do we help all of these like, students want access <laughs> text and, and learn and understand and apply those skills and think critically about the content and the text that's in front of them? So just a talk about proficient readers because there's so much information and data about proficient readers or what I call like the good readers. Um, those who will read something in uh, the first read and have that solid uh, comprehension and understanding. Uh, when we look at like those habits of mind for those proficient readers, uh, here are just some things that Chris Tavani writes about in her book, I read it, but I don't get it. Uh, comprehension strategies for adolescent readers. You know, we know that our proficient readers act to access the schema and, and they're able to use that background information. As they're reading, they're actively engaged. Maybe they're taking notes, they're asking questions, they're making predictions. You know, when they uh, come to a word that they don't know, there is that millisecond where they think, can I read on and still understand the context of what I'm reading? Or do I need to stop and define it? Or is the word defined in context? So, you know, if we can sort of help our students understand uh, whether they're the fix up strategies when they don't understand what they're reading, um, and they can determine what's important versus interesting, then we can sort of help our students where they're at and give them the skills and tools that they need uh, moving forward. So I want you to think deeply right now about three students that you have this, this year so far, and, and then think about what interests you or puzzles you about them, maybe in terms of their reading and their comprehension. So I can tell you, I have a student yeah. right now who literally walks into my class every single day and tells me, I hate reading. And I said, that's great, because now my clear objective is to help you find a book and a text that will make you change your mind and rethink that. But he's definitely a puzzle to me, because I know he's really smart. And at the same time, I tell him, but you're setting yourself up for a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if we tackle where your 
interests are and connect those with reading, maybe we can start to change those ideas. But when we start to think about our students as individuals, you know, we come to understand that they're really like combination locks. The idea is that we each have our own different combination that is going to help unlock and to and help us reach to excellence or success. So think of those students, whether you want to focus on those three tonight or all of your students, you know, what do you need to figure out what that combination lock is and, and unlock that experience that is going to make reading and their connection and interaction with text successful. So for me in my classroom and sort of my teaching philosophy is that learning today needs to be blended, it needs to be personalized, and it's definitely digital. I'll talk about high tech and I'll talk about low tech. In my own classroom, I have Chromebooks uh, that stay in my classroom that my students have access to um, all the time when we need it. But um, in terms of the activities I do, there's a lot of choice, uh, there's a lot of station work, and then there's a lot of me conferencing and interacting with my students to help them succeed. So strategies, because a lot of people are like, what are the strategies? Well, what the other thing is, how many kids are in your class? Uh, depends. So I have a total in, in, among, I teach four English classes, and then I have a, a, like a media literacy elective. So my largest class has 25 students in it. And so, that, so that's hard then to personalize for that many kids. It is. I, I mean, but, and you're still like here, we're in school now, like nine weeks. I'm still getting to know my students in terms of their strengths and their weaknesses. You know, those small assessments that I do help me to determine what I'm doing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, like I do have one, I have one co-taught class. There's 20 students in that. 10 of them have IEPs and three of them in that same class have 504s. I do have a co-teacher, so we have that opportunity to like sit and plan and maybe parallel teach or to like scaffold a writing and reading assignment on a Google form for my students who need that. You know, these are the little strategies that I am just tweaking on a daily basis to really, like I said, help my students succeed and comprehend and connect with text. So, and, and I could talk more uh, about that. So, but yeah, tw my largest class right now is 25. And I feel like my students were like busting out of the seams. So just 25 middle schoolers, think of like six feet three boys and then <laughs> four foot nine students, like all together. Um, and then, like I said, like the other day we did a station rotation and I just had four stations set up for them to move at at their own pace. And I was checking in with them uh, to see what's going on. You know, tomorrow's more of a reading workshop day where they're reading and I have a flip lesson for my students who are advanced and then another scaffolded piece for my students that were struggling with a short little writing assessment I gave them today. And have you ever had any non-readers in your classes? Oh, all the time, every year, in every class. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, you know, I want them to engage with text. And, and so, like, I'll, I do a read aloud in my classroom. I'd say almost every day I'm reading aloud a lot of text. Um, they are, when we're working in stations or reading workshop, it depends on the book. I might have a small group of students in the back where we're, I'm reading aloud the text to them. I am a huge proponent of Audible. I listen to books to and from work every day, even though it's a, for me, a 30 minute commute. I can get through a book in a week or two. That helps me to expand my connection with book books. So that's, again, more strategies. We actually have a higher listening comprehension than we do a reading comprehension. So if my students need audible or for my students who are dyslexic or 
have learning disabilities, they have access to what we call uh, a digital platform called Learning Ally. Um, and I'll talk about that more with some other assistive technology. They're reading along with the book and it's highlighting uh, as it, uh, as the book audiates uh, what's going on in the text. So these are just little things that I have in place to support my, my readers. And my question was really based on something that Tracy had asked, because she says she has some nonverbal and some non-readers in her class. And they tend, they actually tend to be older. They're between 17 and 22 years old. Mm -hmm. so, so as you go through, you know, um, maybe talk about some of the strategies, but you, we, yeah. we don't have to diverge right now, but. No, well, let, let, let me continue. So we're not just looking at a strategy, right. <laughs> but definitely I will get to your question, Tracy, um, because, you know, at all different levels, before reading, during reading, after reading, there's different things that we could put in strategies and activities that we could put in place to help our students. You know, uh, they're like with all the um, amazing amount of ed, ed tech and assistive technology, there's lots of ways to bring our students' voices to the forefront of our classrooms. Uh, whether they are what we would call introverts or nonverbal for that matter, and, and how we can help them connect. You know, for my, my struggling readers, my reluctant readers, and even my English language learners, you know, the best way for me to give them that background knowledge and information uh, is by using visual text and videos. And I really have my students read visual text, whether we start with a photograph or we start with a short or a movie or a mini documentary to help them look at that close, look at the video closely um, and start to try out those uh, reading strategies that we want them to do with print text or literature in the sense of my own uh, English classroom. So I might give my students before uh, before reading uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, I might have a little excerpt from the movie version and put it on an ed puzzle to help them uh, understand the socioeconomic times of of the the period uh, we're doing a little figurative language review so i put a video from vocabulary up on my google classroom for my students to just like as a refresher if they need that um, if depending on the age of your students brain pop has little a uh, cartoony videos uh, about all different topics i find for my eighth graders it's a little more elementary um, but again, you know your students better than I do. A Jacob Burns Film Center, which I have there, um, they're a small theater, a nonprofit theater and educational program in Pleasantville, New York, about a half an hour where I live. And they have online uh, an entire uh, visual literacy curriculum that they share with different video shorts. Um, Play posted again another a place to start where if we if we want our students to read critically ask questions to look at and peel back the layers of text to understand not only like the basic comprehension but also those craft and structure if we um, elements or the author's purpose when we think of those uh, next generation learning standards for our students, the video and the visual text is a great entry point because it's short. We're already living in a visually saturated culture and it can like help and support through different mini lessons. And, and to piggyback on that, there's so much right now with um, augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, and depending on what you have access into your school, if you're talking about something from a geopolitical uh, standpoint or another place in the world or a science aspect in space or in, at sea, you know, you can actually access AR and VR through discovery education 
and Google um, Exploration and even Nearpod has VR now and take students to see different places. So if I'm teaching about the Dust Bowl and maybe my students are reading Bud Not Buddy, I'm going to immerse them in visual images so that they understand the complexities in this book when it comes to economics and topography and geography and the historical and economic aspects and, and class and race. I might show pictures from Dorothea Lange or read aloud excerpts from Karen Hess's Out of the Dust, which is a book told in, in verse about, um, about the Dust Bowl. These are ways to help my students understand and see and build their world knowledge and their word knowledge related to these specific topics. So another strategy is really teaching our students how to read critically and how to read closely. And you know, I say to my own eighth grade students, you've been in school now for eight years and you know that when you're reading something, whether it's in science class or in social studies or, or in science or in English, that there's going to be a test, there's going to be a quiz, there's going to be a paper, a project at some point in that, in that development of that reading experience or that textbook chapter and theme. So we have to read with a very specific purpose to really help us master the, the test, the project, and those key understandings that our teacher is going to present to us. And actually, I learned years ago that Harvard University, their a library, actually included with the admissions letter for their students six strategies that you can utilize to succeed your first year in Harvard. Now, anybody could go online and access that digital uh, article now and I gave you the link for that right with that Google short and right there but the six strategies are preview the text annotate outline summarize analyze look for patterns contextualize compare and contrast these are things that I teach my students up front and then we practice throughout the year um, and ideally you know we're probably already doing as our own as our own adult reading selves, doing a lot of these strategies, but we just don't pay attention to it. And if we give our students that metacognitive recognition of, oh, wow, I just took some notes, and in my notes I summarized it, but I also noticed a pattern that, you know, in the, in the book, Connor says this six times throughout the text. So what does that mean? Or maybe we make those text-to-text -text connections and comparisons or text-to-world comparisons and contrast. So when we deliberately teach our students these strategies and skills and then address them and talk about them and also highlight the students like, wow, did you notice the pattern that Jim just found when we were looking at this um, excerpt right here? Um, can help students to be more confident and critical readers, particularly the type of readers that they need to be in secondary school and in college. So I'm all for, I, you know, I talk about text, so I talked about visual text. You know, my students are reading print text. Uh, they're also reading a lot online. My students are Kindle readers. They'll read something on their iPhone, even though like at my age, I'm like, oh my gosh, that is way too small. I can't do that. Um, but I do find, and there are so many different uh, reading digital reading platforms on the market and you know all of the all of the tech that I'm going to talk about is free because free is fine by me and my school doesn't buy a lot of subscriptions um, actively learn is a digital reading platform that has a free version that I've been using for four or five years now since they were a startup and I found them at ISTE um, 
And there's also a pro version. My school district will not pay for the pro version. And, but I find that there's so much offered on the free version that it's really um, helps my students. Um, and Newzella was another great one and really like went hand in hand with Actively Learn. But now that Newzella is just, you have to pay for the version, I sort of have moved into Actively Learn. And what I like about the this digital reading platform is that they have so many different like high interest texts and poetry and literature and excerpts from books and they're really building out their curriculum. But the other key thing which I love is that it's something that you can completely personalize. I can add and import my own documents when I need. And there's so many things that you can actually do with a digital reading platform from like the skill practice to a jigsaw and differentiated readings. Uh, I assign articles each week to build that background knowledge that the students have to do. It also helps me to track my student growth and that data analysis because it's all done within the context of that platform and my students can read on it, highlight it, it translates in different languages. It will read it, the text aloud for my students who need it. And then my students can answer different questions right in the different platform. So I mentioned before about differentiating and choice and scaffolding. And those are the things that I do on a more daily basis to really personalize and blend. Um, and that might look like a, a game board or when I talk about stations, here is from uh, the second part of To Kill a Mockingbird, I called it To Kill a Mockingbird Opoly, where my students are working through the board that is all hyperlinked, you'll see. Um, and maybe there, are, here is a, an Ed puzzle with Atticus's closing statement. There's some text dependent questions. And depending on who my students are, I might say, you have to do six of among six different assignments to show me your understanding of this part of the text. Or I might say, you need to do the whole board, depending on who my students are and what we're working on. But you'll notice that there are different activities and different links to help build their knowledge. Um, also, I do some gamification in my classroom. So I, here you have a map and the map sort of journeys out where my students are, are going and what activities that they're doing. And that's synced with uh, Google Classroom. Um, I might do a, a tic-tac-toe board after we read a short story together and they have to answer three questions. Again, there's your choice pick any three questions to show me your understanding of Ransom of the Red Chief by O. Henry. And then I do task cards. I might do thing ta the think tac toes, uh, hyperdocs, uh, a choose your own adventure. Maybe there's a menu, roll the dice. These are different choice activities that I'm sort of creating and building for my students to show me their understanding about their reading and they're thinking about their reading. So as we're going through all of these different technology, you know, these different apps and programs, it, you must spend an awful lot of time looking, trying to find these programs. How do you, how did you find them? Uh, in terms of what, what do you mean? In terms well, there, of technology or? Right. It, or how did you, how did you come up with the, with the game of gamifications that you've come up with? How did you uh, find uh, I, I saw Classcraft there. I saw, um, you know, the, well, you mentioned Newzella. Um, you mentioned the uh, the reading program. How do you find them? You know, I will say that social media has been my professional learning community, uh, particularly Twitter for the past ten years or eight years. Um, and you know, that 24 hour PD really like built connections. Uh, I, you're able to meet up with diverse educators. Uh, there are certain, uh, educators that who, whether they're Google innovators or they're just, they've written a book and they, 
uh, share really great resources. I might be inspired by them. Uh, as I said, Actively Learn, I met at ISTE when they were in the startup booth and I sort of became brand loyal <laughs> after that because it, it works so se seamlessly in my classroom. Again, with Classcraft, um, I went to an ed camp and I was in a room with, uh, it was all on gaming. And I, again, there was another piece that was like, this is, I can totally imagine how this is gonna work in my classroom. And I just built off of that. But, you know, as an educator, you know, I went outside of my school district really to learn and, and connect with other educators around the world and always like being inspired and reflecting on what I'm doing and, you know, is it working? Is there something better? What do you recommend? Um, and trying out even among my students, do you, do you like playing Kahoot or do you prefer Quizlet Live? Like, should we try this quizzies? Like, can I try it out? And really, and my, my students are my, my testers and they'll honestly say like, we love it or no, um, don't use this. It was a complete utter fail. I, I had my, my high school and my middle school are, were attached and my, the seniors needed a classroom uh, to practice uh, for their senior scenes. And they, they started, and I was like, oh, you could work in my classroom. It's not a problem. It's a big space. I knew the, the teacher. And they, they're pouring in. And these are all like students that I had like five years ago. And one of my students is like, are you still doing the gaming? That was the best part of your class. And I'm like, oh my God, you're applying to college. I feel so old. But, <laughs> but yes, you're, you're constantly, like any good teacher is reflecting, is exploring, is, is researching, trying to figure out what what's gonna work best for my students. And the fact that all of you are here for this webinar, you know, you are the great teachers. You're looking for what's gonna help my students succeed. And I think that's the quest of any great teacher. You know, what is that strategy? What is that tool that's gonna help me unlock that student and, and so that they can be successful? So that in my case, that they find a book that they fall in love with and realize that reading opens up a whole world of possibility. So in terms of my, it, like even with the assistive technology, I, I work with amazing special ed teachers and I have uh, colleagues who are special ed uh, administrators and teachers and they tend to share with me different strategies and tools. As I said, Learning Ally is something that we use in our district. So my students get the book on, they could read it on, their, on the Chromebook, they could read it on their phone. The text is actually written out and it highlights as the text is played. So they're reading it and listening to it. Um, Rewordify is another great tool, especially for my ELLs and even my students that struggle with really complex text. Um, you put in any text you want and rewordify it, and it completely simplifies it. Like even something like the Constitution of the United States, when we look at it really closely, you're like, wow, our founding fathers use some pretty big vocabulary. What does this mean for somebody who just came to the United States or has only been here for a year? who doesn't have that historical knowledge of American history the way that our students who've been here, who grew up here and have been learning history throughout their elementary school, how can we help our ELL succeed that way? Um, Read Write has so many little great tools. Um, the Read Write toolbar, you can leave uh, voice text and comments for students. Again, highlights the little pop-ups that help. They have some other different like Fluency Tutor and WriteQ or other extensions for Chrome that can help you. Uh, Listen-wise, let students listen and read at the same time, just like Learning Ally. Learning Ally is subscription-based. Uh, voice stream, another uh, speech to text, text to speech for your student. So we're trying to like figure out what are those uh, tools that are going to help 
all of our students succeed. And even more, I mentioned Newzella, Google Expeditions. You know, you have a student who is maybe nonverbal, but you can use something like Storyboard That, and they can draw online and write out their response in little captions and make a story map or a, even a, um, like their own little graphic novel. Padlet is another great tool where you can ask students to share their responses in like a large class brainstorm. I use Dice, I use Play-Doh, I use Legos to help my students showcase their understanding, you know, build me a scene from these different chapters, you know, show me in Play-Doh what, how, why reading is important. Uh, Flipgrid is a great tool to have students share verbally instead of uh, in writing their response to a question or a prompt. Uh, my students love Quizlet Live because not only do you have the flashcards, but then you could take that information from the flashcards and play a game among your students. You know, it's really about creating opportunities to support all the readers in your classrooms, you know, breaking down reading into manageable tasks, teaching with visuals, whether it's movies, photographs, TED Talks, like all these things really help our students who are visual learners as well as auditory learners. Uh, I use sentence frames or sentence starters to help my students, uh, particularly when they have to articulate academic language. Uh, like one of my colleagues will say like, oh, she's, Michelle is taking out the Mad Libs again. But if that's what I need to do to help my students write a short response or to show them how to lead into or lead out of a quotation within a short response or a literary essay, you know, I will do that. Um, it could even be using a, a graphic organizer to break down their thinking. Uh, other things, differentiating the process, the product, the topic, you know, there's all different ways that we can differentiate to support our students and, and knowing our students and, and creating the opportunities where it's going to celebrate their skills, their abilities, cultures, and identity. That's really important. We can't just like throw them into group work. We want to really uh, help them to um, showcase what their skills and their knowledge and and really include them into the curriculum and and i'm all for increasing choice and increasing student voice and that might be instead of like we're all reading the same book that there's a, a con, i'll say a controlled choice of dystopian text or books about social justice and letting students pick you know what their assessment is going to be whether you want to do that by with a choice board or a menu board or a 258 to really help them so i'm curious uh, i um there's there's been this big debate about whether whether it's better to give kids different you know the same information but like leveled reading and so you know you have the 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 bit the higher vocabulary or the lower vocabulary or the easier reading versus um, versus giving kids material that is so interesting that they will read above their levels. I, I saw, uh, I was looking at your, your Twitter feed and I saw that uh, Vicki Cobb had been on your, uh, you know, had been on your, your, your feed and she was just, she's this big proponent that uh, that leveled reading is, um, is basically lazy. It means you know you're you're not interesting the kids, so you're giving them pablum, which they'll get through, but they won't enjoy. Versus finding authors that really ignite their um, their enthusiasm. So where do you come in on 
Yeah, I, I don't believe in Lexile scores. I mean, when I think about my own students, you know, you give my son, he loves fishing and deep sea. He will read anything about the Titanic. And even when he was in elementary school, he was reading like adult specific books about the Lusitania because it was about <laughs> ships and history and war. It wasn't about his Lexile score. And so yes, the what you said earlier on, it, it was really the latter. It doesn't it matters what the student is interested in and that's that's where their engagement is because you know if they're a computer programmer they can read those programming textbooks to me it looks like a foreign language <laughs> until i read it multiple times and it might be at my lexile score but in terms of my interest or my engagement it's not there the way it might be with uh, uh, something else that it depends so yes we want to find uh engaging and interesting topics and that might include like when my students are writing and researching for their investigative articles investigative research articles um they'll i share them uh, an article that i found in popular science about you know how there is a whole team of scientists that are looking at at ways to mine uh the metals that are in feces and that because like we all like ingest um, minute and microscopic pieces of metal or maybe uh, you have metal fillings, like whether it's gold or what, I mean, whatever is in our mouths or, you know, in our shampoos and conditioners. Um, and the whole piece is about like these st scientists studying poop. Yes, I'm looking like playing with this idea of like, I'm going to get you eighth graders. I'm going to make you crack up because we are going to talk about poop today and talk about the way that the writer addresses this as a scientific topic um, and how that little teaser can help us uh, plan that out. My article this week uh, that my students did because it's Halloween was all about, you know, can you change, if you're freaked out and scared of something, can you actually change your mindset to not be afraid and have arachnophobia or a fear of heights? And, um, and I was uh, listening to a bunch of students talk about like, well, would you really be scared if Pennywise came in right now? And I mean, they're engaging in about this topic. It had nothing, I didn't pick it because of the Lexile score. And I know that if I'm putting it in actively learn that, you know, I have different links and, and visuals that are added into the article. If my students who are, I have a, a few students we have a, a small, like 10% of our students are Japanese and they, English is not their first language. So I, they can translate it into Japanese for my students who are dyslexic or they have a lower reading level, you know, they'll have the whole text read aloud as they're reading. Those are strategies to help them access those texts. But definitely, yes, throw out the, the Lexile score. I'm sorry that uh, if I am making anybody upset, I don't level the book. I love it. Class. I love hearing that actually. <laughs> um, I, I happen to agree with it too, but so. You know, find things that are gonna engage your students. If they love sports, bring in the sports novels. If they love scary and freaky fantasy, bring it on. If they want raw and gritty and, you know, cursing obnoxious teenagers in contemporary young adult fiction, go for it. Um, and then try it as a podcast, try it as a print text, try it as with a short little feature. I love, um, you know, New York Times has two different features that I love. One, they have a section called uh, the Op Docs, which are these like short, uh, opinionated documentaries um, that are on there are some there are about about five minutes to 20 minutes at the greatest and they cover all different topics everything from talking about race to there's one I showed my students about being autistic and like this whole idea of like you know 
what we define as, you know, other and about choosing kindness. And you watch that and, and what does it make, what do you see? What do you hear? What does it make you wonder? That's your entryway to then further their, their discussions. Depending on what it is, we might read it a second, watch it a second time. And now I want you to pay attention to this character or what the director is doing. That's one thing that New York Times has that I love. Another thing that they do um, is called the anatomy of a scene. And if you're an English teacher like me and you're teaching about craft and structure in the anatomy of the scene series, they each week take a movie that's coming out in the movie theater and they have a director or a producer. They showcase the scene and then the director or the producer is talking over the scene about the choices that he or she made in that particular scene. So why the placement, the colors, what's actually going on in the scene. That's all craft and structure. That's all next generation reading standards, anchor standards. You know, students need to understand that texts are manipulated and, and that writers, directors, they're making specific choices to get a reaction out of their viewers and readers. And I want my students to understand that, whether we're talking about film or we're talking about a, a book, I want you to read it with X-ray eyes. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's say, all right, all right, so last, last point, and then we'll take other questions from other people. So in my book, Personalized Reading, I say when th used thoughtfully and purposefully, technology tools can help students understand their world, ignite a passion for learning. I'm not choosing a tool first. I think about how that tool can support my student and does it help me reach the goals whether it's the 21st century skills or the, the, or the next generation standards to help them. So I don't necessarily like say, oh, here's a tool I like, how could I fit it in? It's more of what are we doing? Oh, this might work or this is a, a great choice for students to explore. So definitely connect with me. Here is my email and my blog and my Twitter, although I haven't been really active on Twitter, I'm getting back into the, back on that scene. Um, and I talk, I love talking gamification. Reading is something that I'm just passionate about, as well as writing is my most recent book and all the different ways that we can uh, write for different purposes and, and, and different products and, and text. What are some of the, uh, I get, what are some of the, the times where you've been like uh, most amazed by what your students have done? I think uh, probably every unit my students really uh, inspire me and amaze me. You know, I, I'm somebody who, I, I don't, I feel like, hmm, like I never do 100% of the same thing every year. I'm somebody who goes back and looks at something and changes it up and it's never, it's never done. It's just, it's like a constant work in progress. But like last year, um, last year I was moving at a very fast pace for my students. Uh, for my other two English colleagues in the eighth grade. And I was like, okay, I can add something in. And we used to do a murder mystery with Agatha Christie that we had sort of retired. But I was like, you know what? Let's bring this back. Let's do some mystery writing. And um, really focusing on, on scene and description and imagery. And my students each wrote these short murder mystery stories. And some of them just, I, I have a friend who's an editor at HarperCollins and she was like, send them to me. Cause I was like, oh my gosh, you guys have the craziest, scariest ideas. And I hope nobody is looking at our 
our feed like of what we're searching on right. Google for like machetes and different <laughs> weapons. <laughs> but I ended up doing a I ended up the they did their short stories. I took them home. I read them all. I picked four one four in each of my classes that I thought were like really unique and engaging and surprising and like we had talked about like all the different qualities. I read I picked the four the next I came back into school on Monday. I actually photocopied each of the four sets and my students spent the entire period reading the four in their class narrowing down the four to the one person in the class although they never knew anybody's names who was on which papers uh then they had to pick and vote for their top paper that would represent the class and then i had the four classes the top papers go head to head against each other, almost like a bracket. <laughs> um, and they, again, no names, and they read those last four, and then on like a Google form, they voted for the, who was the top mystery writer, which we then shared with like the school newspaper. Um, but yeah, they, you know, they, students surprise you every day. They, they say things that you're like, wow, that's really insightful, or I didn't see that. And then, or they will create something and, um, you know, it inspires me. It makes me think about doing something differently or, you know, adding another element. Mm -hmm. So it's, so, um, there's a, there's a question from, uh, uh, Rosie, who's, uh, it's, so I happen to love the name Rosie because that's my daughter's name. So, uh, but uh, who want, wanted to get ideas on, you'd mentioned some assistive technology uh, tech, uh, programs and uh, which, she was curious which ones were free. So Rewordify is free. Read Write for Google Chrome is free. Listen wise is free and voice dream is free depending on what you are looking for. And there's the, the new one from uh, or the, the Microsoft one that I think is it's free yeah. also that um, that integrates with um, with the browser and inter integrates with um, Word 365. I, I can't I just can't remember the name of it. You probably yeah, I, I, I will say, you know, I Microsoft has some amazing tools. Unfortunately, I'm not in a Microsoft school. I feel like you're either a Microsoft like school or you're a Google school. And because we're a Google school, most of the things that I'm using uh, are compatible with Chrome. Mm -hmm. And but I and I did go to this past June. I was in a, a session and even I will say that the Microsoft translator is a hundred times better than Google Translate. I do not find Google Translate a trustworthy at all um, with my students uh, who uh, their first language is not English. Um, so and Microsoft has some great assistive technology. I think that's ahead of Google. Um, but I can't really talk about that because I don't use it. It's, it's an, as you're talking, I was, um, uh, a year or so ago, I was traveling in Portugal and I speak very little Portuguese, and, but a lot of people were, would just take out their phone and they would say something in rapid Portuguese and, you know, use either Microsoft or Google translate to then just show me what they talked about. And it wasn't perfect, but I could understand them. Yes. It's funny. So, and there's, in terms of, I mean, I'm just highlighting five here. I mean, there are so many, you can just like search up and read different uh, blog posts that about more uh, universal design and assistive technology, depending on, you know, what you're really looking for. I mean, there are so many text to speech, speech to text uh, uh, programs out there. Um, you got to find the one that you're most comfortable with or the one that's going to work best for your students. And depending on your tech policy in your school, um, that also might, uh, might be a, a factor to consider. Not only just is it free, but also does it follow along? My school has a very strict uh, technology policy and they have a list of like, educational 
platforms that we can use. And if we want to use something else, uh, we have to submit a proposal and it has to be evaluated by our tech committee to make sure that it's okay. Um, and it, it, like I said, it depends on, on your school. You know, I was using Remind for a while and I completely, like, we don't use that anymore because of uh, COPA policies and also they were sharing um, information and selling it to third parties. So my school was like, please don't use this anymore. Wow. So these are things that you just have to, again, depending on your school and your students, you want to do a little due diligence and see what works best for and fits within the policies and and your students abilities and and needs now part of part of reading and part of literacy is also being able to understand the difference between uh, lies opinion mm -hmm. uh, facts uh, hypotheses and and theories so how do you uh, how do you deal with with that with with kids because it's so much in the news right now Mitch that's a whole other webinar <laughs> for another day okay so just in two <laughs> minutes then <laughs> but you know we have to one it's all about reliable and find valid and reliable sources and teaching our students that those digital citizen chip strategies and tools using even you know in my media literacy class talking about you know upsplash or creative commons like when they're putting images into their slide deck i mean most of the pictures that i have are from my own classroom that i took but citing that's really important i actually start out my school year the past few years i've started with my investigative journalism writing unit where my students are writing about a problem that they want to change and you know when they're researching we do i do a whole lesson about reliable and trustworthy and i'll have all different like text around the rooms or qr codes linking to text and i'll have something from the onion or something from like the npr or a cnn or fox news and and talk about bias and talk about um what makes it like is it believable what makes you say that why is it reliable did you click on the different links what did you find you know and looking at different bogus websites mm -hmm. um and and pointing those out to students you know noticing it's is it a url is it a dot com is it a dot net is it an edu and and also using the databases that our school library has um, for research like these are steps that we need to take and also teach to our students uh, so that they're familiar with it citations I'm big on you must like put the page number where the quote came from and your short response like little things like that to help prepare them these are all stepping stones as they go up in high school and in college as well so just review for, for everybody, what are, you, what are you talking about at FETC? So I am talking about personalized reading and the digital tools and strategies that can support our diverse readers. So I'll go into uh, more extensive uh, activities and lessons at, in what I've shared uh, tonight. Uh, they'll just be a lot more. It's a two-hour workshop, so it's going to be a little more hands-on for teachers also to build out their own hyperdocs and build those choice boards or learning experiences that can help their students to uh, access text and be more successful uh, and when they're reading closely or critically about it. Sounds great. And um, what, uh, I guess, what kind of closing announcements or what kind of closing thoughts would you have for people? If you had, uh, you know, I guess two or three things that you want people to, to leave here with tonight, what would they be? I'd say never stop learning. <laughs> you know, there are so many resources available. And yes, there's so much stuff that you have to weed through. Uh, but, you know, go on Twitter, follow your blogs, you know, look to the trustworthy educators who are sharing innovative 
resources and techniques and strategies and then be reflective about it how uh, it you can make it and personalize it for your own classroom uh, that's number one never stop reading reading is so important and know that when we're reading we're reading text we're reading video we're reading print we're reading digital let your students access all those different types of text to help them and and really give your students choice and voice in your classroom and and let them share more about themselves and what's working for them and take those times to be reflective where it could be just a short little exit slip you know did do you understand what we talked about today you know what makes you say that to something more detailed and specific what are your writing goals or your reading goals based on what we've been working on these past 10 weeks in school so it's not just giving them textbooks and worksheets Throw out those worksheets. <laughs> <laughs> Who still has textbooks in this day and age? <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, it's, it sounds really interesting at FETC, and I, I have to say, it was you're you're very inspiring. Uh, listening you. to how you it's it's not just well as you know it's not really the tools. Um, the the tools are what allows you to um, masterfully reach your students and okay. and engage them. So. That really came through tonight. So just want to thank you very much. And thank you for appearing thank on Edgehead Interactive. Thank you and, for everyone being here, yes. And who knows? I mean, we'll, uh, hopefully we'll see you at FETC. And yes. uh, since we're not that far apart geographically, may, who, who knows? Yes, maybe we have to meet up. Right. And, that would and, be great. And yes, and if anybody has specific questions for me or connect with me, Jean, my brother-in-law, is a designer. So if you want to wow. send me an email, uh, he goes to FIT sometimes and talks to high school and incoming students. So if you wanted to Skype or Zoom in with uh, to make that connection for your fashion students, reach out to me. We could talk more. Great. Well, thank you again. And I'll uh, sign off for EdChat Interactive. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg. Please join us at another EdChat Interactive. We're doing uh, a session next week and the week after also, edchatinteractive.org. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you again. Good night.